At what point did you decide to parallelise the events of books uh, four and five, I think it is? Uh, well, I don't remember a precise date or time or anything. Um, you know, it was once again a case, as happened way back with Game of Thrones, when I, I split off Clash of Kings, where uh, the book was getting longer and longer, and there was like no end in, in sight. Um, and I was faced with a book, you know, the Dance with Dragons and Storm of Swords before it are really physically about as big as any publisher cares to publish. And, and even there, some publishers don't care to publish that book. You know, I only get away with it because my books are very successful, so they, they cut me a little extra slack. But uh, a new writer who delivered a 1,500-page manuscript would be promptly told by their publisher to cut 300 pages or something like that, if not 500 pages. Um, so when my books start getting up <clears throat> 1,300, 1,400, 1,500 pages in manuscript, I start seeing how far off is the ending. And in the, in the case of uh, A Dance with Dragons, which was the book I thought I was writing at that time, I, I'm, I'm passing Storm of Swords in page count length, and I've hardly started some of the storylines yet. I mean, you know, I don't write these characters in the order in which you read them. You know, I, I don't, I, I tend to stick with one character. So I may write five or six Daenerys stories or, or and then, switch gears and write five or six uh, Tyrion chapters. So that as a result, I can wind up with thousands of pages of manuscripts in which I haven't yet written anything about, say, Bran, which was actually the case in that case with, uh, with, with Feast for Crows. Uh, when I did do the split, I, I hadn't written a word about Bran in that, uh, in that book yet, uh, but I had, I had the Daenerys stuff almost pretty, pretty far along. I had Tyrion. Uh, across the narrow sea and down the river as far as Volantis, I think. I, and I was going to break him there in Volantis and continue on to the next book. But there were other people that I've hardly started. I had to do a lot of work at the wall. But I had all the King's Landing stuff, pretty much as you've seen it, the, the Cersei stuff, the Jamie stuff, all of that. Um, so at that point, I was wrestling, well, I, I, for one thing, the fans and my publishers both were howling for a book. It had already been, it had already been five years, and uh, I'd missed several deadlines. I, I kept promising when I was going to deliver the book. You know, I'm, I'd originally, in, in a crazed excess of optimism, had to hope to deliver um, Dance with Dragons in 2002, so it could be published in 2003. Uh, so now we're into like 2005 and it's still not out and uh, it's still not finished and it's not even being close to finished. And uh, I could sense the impatience uh, from my readers and from my publishers and, uh, you know, rightfully so. So I, and the book is so long, you know, well, what, what do I have to do? What are my choices? Well, one, I can make severe cuts. I can eliminate uh, hundreds of pages of what I've written here and try to bring it to a thing, but I didn't like that thing. I liked what I'd written. Uh, two, I can split the book in two. You know, I can just sort of end the book where it is. I got 1,500 pages. Let me send it in and say, here it is, publish it. And some characters, there'd be big stories, some characters would be other stories. But then it dawned on me that I could split the book, but I could split the book geographically. Split the book, not, not chronologically, but geographically by character. Taking out and publishing the storylines that were finished. Some of them required a little more work. I had to wrap them up and, and complete. And moving Daenerys, who after all was on another continent, and moving the stuff at the wall you know, to, to the next book. And that seemed to me to be the best solution. Um, to this day, I don't know that it was necessarily an ideal solution. Um, but I th still think it might have been the best solutions of the, of the options that I had, given, given the circumstances um, that existed at the time. But it's hard to tell, you know? Some people liked it, some people didn't. If you combine, I mean, you could still create the book that would have been, I suppose, by taking Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons and 
interleaving the chapters chronologically, but of course what, what you'll get will, is a book of prohibitive size that will be the size of the OED, and uh, you'll probably need a magnifying glass to read the print in it. Uh, and with so many characters and so many storylines that you, you will lose a certain amount of focus. Um, you know, the, the way the books are structured now, Feast at least is a strongly focused book. It, so much of it takes place around Cersei and uh, Jaime and the events at King's Landing, uh, you know, with a few sidebars, but the, the King's Landing thing is really the heart of that. And then with Dance with Dragons, the focus is much more on Danny and on the wall and on the characters making their way toward Danny. So I, I think two books with a stronger focus was probably better than one enormously uh, huge book with 27 viewpoint characters and all these stories going on at once. But you know, that's, that's you pay your money and it takes your choice here and uh, Opinions may differ. That's that's why we uh, have these reviews and debates and panels and all that to argue these points. Next, um, hi. Um, you talked about how uh, the books are very big uh, and expansive, and um, what I'm just th always thinking when I read them is they're also very very detailed. So yes. I just wanted to ask you about that really. How you manage to have something going on in the background, whether it's Mormont's Raven or some noise being made. Uh, all those little details that really make the book special, perhaps? Well, the devil is in the details, they say. I love the details. Um, I think the details make the books immersive, and uh, that's what I want as a, as a writer, and that's also what I want as a, as a reader when I read a book. Um, This almost gets into a lecture that I sometimes give at writers' conferences, but uh, let me let me just touch on the high points of it here. It, you know, why why do we read fiction? Uh, what what is it that uh, attracts us to reading these stories about lands that uh, that don't exist and people who don't exist and conflicts that never happened? What's what's the the appeal of fiction? Um, to my mind, it's vicarious experience. I, I think we live through fiction. Um, you know, I, I look back on the books that I read when I was young, uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, I, I remember the Council of Elrond. I remember um, Sam and Frodo making their way across the, the plains of Moria. I remember these events almost as if they happened to me. I remember the fog on the Barrow Downs. Uh, these things have, have become part of my memory now. I read these when I was like 12 or 13 years old. I don't remember what I had for dinner the night that I read about the Council of Elrond. I don't remember uh, who sat behind me in my junior high school class or who sat in front of me. or. I'd even have to think back to try to figure out who the hell the teacher was, and I probably wouldn't be successful. So which of these is really part of my life? Which is, has I lived, not to get all existential? Well, uh, I think it's the things that we incorporate. It's the things that we remember. We, all of us as human beings, are sums of our memories and our lives. When we, when we live our lives and we reflect our lives, vicarious experience can be just as important as real experience, and that's why I've been known to say that uh, a reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, while the, the man who does not read lives only one. Um, and I think that's true, you know. As a reader, I've, I've climbed mountains, I've visited other planets, I've, I've uh, dove to the bottom of the sea, I've sailed the Spanish <laughs> Main and fought pirates, uh, I've loved a thousand beautiful women, um, I've uh, died, I've had children, I've had all these experiences that I've never had in real life, but and yet they're, these, they're, they're part of me. And they've made my life immensely richer. So that's what I want to do for my reader. I want, when you, you're finished with my books, I want you to feel that you lived those books, not that you simply read some words on a page. Um, so I want to immerse you in the world. And details are part of that. Details are probably the, the most essential part of that. Um, you know, you, 
you read some of these modern writers, and, and they're like page turners, uh, the John Grishams of the world, the, the James Pattersons of the world. There's nothing but dialogue. They almost read like screenplays, you know, two guys talking in an office. They never describe the office. They never describe what they're doing. You know, a guy walks into a bar. You never see the bar. I mean, there are bars and bars. There are fern bars and there are dive bars and there are, every bar is different and, and uh, some bars are unique. I don't, I don't want that kind of fiction and I don't want to give my readers that kind of fiction. I want you to see the place and smell the place and taste the food and uh, I want it to be as real as if you were living the book. And that's why I, I put so much detail in. And I recognize that this is not for everybody. This is, you know, some people do not uh, value that in fiction. Some people, I mean, I've had people tell me that, that uh, they, they skim over all the details. Oh, well, that boring descriptive part. I don't want to just get on with the story, you know? Well, fine, but uh, those people can read James Grisham. Uh, you know, I mean, there's lots of readers, writers out there for, for those people who, who don't want the immersive experience who obviously get something else out of their fiction than, than what I want out of fiction and what I'm trying to provide to my readers. So does that cover it? I hope it covers it. But, uh. <laughs> um, with so many complex characters, how do you keep their timeline straight so that it all works? With increasing difficulty. <laughs> uh, the, the timelines in Dance with Dragons drove me mad. Uh, you know, trying to figure out I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just a question of keeping a calendar and all that. There, there are dramatic demands, too, you know. In terms of the pacing of the book, you want certain, certain events to come before other events, and you want to build to certain climaxes, and you, you don't want two things stepping on each other's toes, even if they're happening on different parts of the world. So I, I was always wrestling with what, what I called the Marinese knot in, in, in Dance with Dragons, which was the, the order in which certain people should arrive at Marine and, and where events in Marine should be when this character arrived and where things should have progressed to when this character arrived and has this turn or twist happened yet and rewriting it and, and changing it and, and I kept doing it saying, no, this doesn't quite work because, well, it works for this character, but then this character is sort of out of it and it's sort of anticlimactic when he shows up. I, I got to get him there earlier. Oh, no, but that, that means this thing doesn't work anymore. So it's, it's challenging. It's challenging, so uh, you know, I'm, I may you know just kill a bunch of these guys, and uh, <laughs> that'll just simplify things uh, no end. 